Um, I want to welcome everyone here today. Thank you for coming to Yorkville. I know it's not uh, like in everyone's neck of the woods, and for some people it's a trek, and parking is never fun. But luckily we got a gorgeous day, so hopefully you can go for a walk after and take in some of the sights. Um, this little church has been across the street from our office since we started. Obviously it was here long before we were. And uh, we've stared at it, looked at it, and one day I walked in and I spoke to the nice gentleman who manages it. And I said, can we ever like use this space for an office meeting? And they said, absolutely. You know, it's called the Heliconian Center and it's been around for years. And it's named after a small island, I think, in Greece. So it has an interesting history, and uh, it's also a place where you know local artisans display their works. Um, a lot of them are really well priced, so you should look at them. But they have displays here that change almost on a weekly basis. So it's a really cool space that you probably never even knew existed until you saw it in my email, because it's the kind of place you walk by a hundred times. Um, so with no more further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, Barry Lebo, for those of you who don't know him, is a leader in the industry. He's been selling real estate and in the real estate world um, for decades. He's, I don't know if you realize, you taught me a, a course on Treb years ago. And uh, I remember the first time he came into our office and it was for a UJA meeting. And um, Richie was in the office with me and he walked up to me and whispered in my ear, I think that's Barry Lebo. And it was like, I don't know, I could have had Adam Sandler or George Clooney and it would have got the same reaction. He was so excited. And I was worried he was from Canada Revenue. <laughs> he kept saying to me, what's Barry Lebo doing here? What's Barry? Anyway, we're so lucky to have him here with us today. He's been a voice of reason and, and there's a lot of chaos in this industry, as you know. So he's always the voice of reason. He helps us make sense of things. He's, um, he's well known throughout social media. Uh, for his stories, anecdotes, and perspectives on what's going on in our world. So uh, there isn't a post that he puts out there that I don't bother reading. And he can be out for lunch with Vivian and I still want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I want to pass it on to Barry. Hopefully he can help us make some sense today of this current real estate industry and, um, and help us plan for the future when, you know, when we're all sort of feeling a little bit unsettled about what's coming next. He's going to speak for a few minutes, and then we're going to have a little roundtable discussion with our with my ma my partner managers who are here from some other branches. So welcome everyone, and I'm going to pass it on to Barry. Thank you. I got a mic. Okay, perfect. So I I, I come in here. By the way, uh, this is not my normal style to stand up here. I'm the guy that walks around and moves, but they've got me on Zoom. <laughs> so in respect to the Zoom, I shall stay within the camera range. Thank you. Um, I want to let you know why I'm here. Kathy phones me. She's lovely. I mean, who doesn't know Kathy and go, she's lovely. <laughs> and Kathy says to me, Barry, are you proud to be Canadian? I'm going, where's this going? I go, yeah, of course I'm proud to be Canadian. Do you believe in the Canadian way of life? I go, Kathy, yeah. Do you believe in the concept of democracy? I said, to the most part, yeah. Do you believe in free speech? I said, yes. Yeah. Good, would you like to come and give one? <laughs> and I'm here. So why am I here? This is my 55th year in real estate, which means that I was at a Mike Ferry event. Mike Ferry's up on stage years ago. And he says, who got into real estate to, not to make money? And I, one hand goes up, me. Mike Ferry looks and goes, what? You got in, way out, you got into real estate not to make money? I go, and he comes running down, holds the microphone in front of me, angry. He thought I was playing with him. He says, why did you get into real estate? I go, I failed at everything else. <laughs> That's not a lie. Um, I was out of school at 17. Um, I'll tell you how old I am. I was 15 years old. Um, 60 years ago, I watched my dear friend give a piano recital right there while I sat right there. So there was one club in Yorkville called Club 71. That was the only club down here. And that was a guy named Yusso from Yusso's Restaurant. So I've watched this change dramatically. Um, 55 years in real estate, I've been broke 
dead broke. Broke would have been easy. Broke means you own, you just have no money. I was, one time I was $20 million in the hole. Another time I was $3 million in the hole. And I remember the day that I didn't owe any money and I was just broke and I thought I had a revelation. I don't owe any money. I don't owe anybody anything. So I've seen real estate go up. I've seen real estate go down. I've learned the lessons. Ladies and gentlemen, I've survived. I have the battle scars of three real estate crashes. This is not a crash. This is not a crash. A crash is when you go to a balloon, you take a pin and you go boom and the balloon breaks. This is somebody went to the balloon, put a little pin in and the air is slowly going out. I want you to understand something. The worst day in the history of the Toronto real estate pre, uh, past, post World War II was probably 1980-81. Mortgage rates hit 21 and three quarters at all the prime banks. 21 and three quarters. Who in their right mind would get a mortgage at 21 and three quarters? Of course, this schmuck, my mortgage came due and had to renew, so I got a break. I got 19% of my house in Bathurst Manor. But unemployment was 13%. If you have a crash, is this 13% today? Do we have 13% unemployment? Absolutely not. Let me ask you a question. So my girlfriend lives around the corner from here. And I see, I sat with her one day and I said to her, where do you live? She says, I live in Yorkville. I said, no, you don't. She says, yes, I do. I says, think about it in a greater perspective. Where do you live? And she says, what are you getting at? I says, you live within walking distance of U of T and the University Healthcare Network. Let me ask you a question. Anybody here from a small town? I am originally. I, when I was a commercial real estate appraiser, I was all over North America. And I'd go into a St. Thomas, Ontario, and there, the Sterling Truck Company went out of business and the whole economy went. Do you really think the economy of Toronto could collapse? We have around you all the hospitals, the university, you've got, well, it was Ryerson, I don't know what they're calling themselves this week. Um, <laughs> Then we've got George Brown, we've got all the other community colleges. Do you realize how large the workforce is in Toronto? Almost all the head offices are here, everything else. The Toronto economy doesn't collapse. It may have some ripples, it may have some... We are not a one-horse town, so please get it through your head. And this is why I bring it back to the worst day in post history of Toronto Real Estate Board. In 1981, when mortgage rates were 21 and three quarters and, it, and people were out of work and stores were closing, Treb sold more houses than you could imagine. I want you to really, really think, I'm in the market right now Let's say, just give for an example, I can only afford an $850,000 house. That house that is now $1 million, I can't afford it. I'm 850. In some months from now, that million dollar house may be 850. All of a sudden, I have a buying opportunity. See, here's something I've learned. I was 40 something years old in life until I learned this. Have you ever met extremely rich people that you look at and say, they don't seem smart. <laughs> How the hell did they make it? Really? And you sit there and it took me forever to understand shrewd and smart aren't the same thing because you've also met a ton of smart people who are broke. So shrewd and smart are two separate things. I just know I'm with a family, I'm, um, I'm in court, I'm, I'm testifying as an expert witness in a very large tax case on a whole city block in a city outside of Toronto, and the family is a very well-known Canadian family, and I, I'm driving with a son um, who's a lawyer by profession, and I said to him, your dad made his money during the Depression. 
what was your dad's formula? Now, I'm a guy that went to York University to take um, algorithms. I took um, um, standard deviations and multiple regression analysis. Real estate, I had to understand real estate. He looks and he goes, you know, it's like that old, it's, there's an old Jewish joke of, you know, I, I, how'd you get rich? Well, I bought it $1, I sold on $2. On the 1%, I made a living. So you have to think about that. So <laughs> what happens is, it, I, I said, how did your father make his money? He says, $35. I said, what? He says, my father had a $35 rule. Now, I've taken all this sophisticated real estate evaluation. What's a $35 rule? My father bought buildings that if they kicked off not less than, if they kicked off over $35 or more per month positive cash flow, he bought it. He built one of the largest fortunes in Ontario doing that. Real estate's not sophisticated. That's the other thing we've learned. All these analysis. If you're analytical, get out. Don't, don't, don't stop with the analytical. So where are we right now? I, I'm using, I don't have my proper um, advanced thing, whatever it's called. So we've got all these things being thrown at us. Now remember this too. There's studies done. And, oh, I gotta be careful. I'm not in camera range. There are studies done that show the greater the media attention to an event, the greater the public reaction. I'll give you a good example of that. Urea formaldehyde was never really a big issue. And yet, it affected 100,000 Canadians. McLean's Magazine once took one of their entire magazine issues devoted to Eufy. It was all over. Do you ever see it in the papers anymore? It's not there because the public has moved on from it. But the media picks up a negative. I get calls from the media all the time if I would take a position on something that I can't take a position on, but that's what they want to hear. I did a CBC interview. I said, if interest rates go beyond a certain rate, hit over 10%, there'll be blood in the streets. What did CBC do? They cut out the first part of what I said, and on television it came out, and there'll be blood in the streets. And I got phone calls. Oh, did I get phone calls. Bad phone calls. So where are we right now? Will the market crash in 2022? And the answer is no. No. Because what the economists never figured out. Who follows economists? Do you follow the RBC? Do you follow? I do. I, I read every day. They've never understood the emo. I can't be crude. I have to be careful here. <sighs> There's an emotional factor. Let's not kid ourselves. You walk in the door, you either hate the house or you love the house. You fall in love. This is an emotional business. And people don't understand. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really simple. People are coming from, to Canada for a lot of reasons from 140, 150 countries. And why are they coming here? They're coming for a better life. But what is it? Where they come from, even if a suppressed regime they don't have our mortgage system. They don't have our banking system. Owning a home is beyond the capabilities of most of these people. And when they come to Canada, the freedom to be able to buy a house is greater than the reality of 21 and three quarter percent mortgages and 13% unemployment. The emotional factor, I've learned this. The thing is, what do you do to, you shift. I have shifted so many times in real estate. Oops. Is this, ah, uh, shoot, I hit something I shouldn't. Oh, there we go. Whoops. So, look at this guy. I see YouTube. There's so much crap on YouTube about the dying markets and, you know, where prices on the brink. That's sensationalism. The negative is the public starts to perceive it. And when the public perceives it, this is where the problems are too. The problems are that they say house prices have dropped. No, they haven't. Some house prices have dropped in some areas. I'll be as blunt as possible. Right now, where I thrive as a realtor, in the basic houses. I love Scarborough. I love Rexdale. You get a listing. I don't spend $20,000 in marketing. I spend about two grand tops, 1,200 to 2,000. Why? They're money in the bank, priced right there, poppers. You get the listing, 900, 850, 875, they're gone. That's a market. There will always be that market. That is also something I've learned. I got a call to, be in, to take a listing on the bridal path. 
not long ago. I sat down, I did the math. The house wasn't finished. A guy had defaulted. It was a mortgage company called me. I took one look and basically I passed. Why? I could sell three houses the way I, and have less aggravation and not be involved in that many months. I'm not, I'm not interested. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this to you. A lot of us think we're gonna win the Academy Award for real estate. Nobody cares. The only thing that matters in real estate where your name is, not on a trophy, it's pay to the order of. <laughs> My broker, we have an awards event coming up, by the way, and I'm gonna get another award. And I'm like, I said to my broker, what's this thing cost you, 50 bucks or something? He goes, yeah, I said, I've had enough awards, but I've never had enough $50. Can you just give me the cash? <laughs> so this is where MLS data would be pure. MLS data would be pure if all houses in the, in the sampling were the same. Well, they're not. Let me ask you a question. See this family, pretty nice ladies. If you look at the ages of the great grandmother, the grandmother, the mother and the child, you tell me what's the average and how does it relate to any of them? And that's what's wrong with averages. Averages need a humongous sampling, but the sampling has to be pure. You can't just take MLS data and live with it. When people throw MLS data at me, I laugh at it because it's not pure, it's imperfect. Unless you're working, and if you sat down and did all houses over $2 million around Lonsdale that sold, that were detached, that were renovated, you've got to set the criteria. I'm working right now, I do a lot of litigation work, lawyers, and I'm working on a thing right now where a certain townhouse that was um, taken from somebody, the easiest way to say it, had three car parking up in the burbs. You go find townhouses at three car parking. It's not easy. So you have to compare stuff. So you get this stuff, a market snapshot. My office sends this out every month. I don't even open them. It's crap. Don't open them. This is what they say about location, location, location. I used to be in the earliest years of the internet. I'm a bit of a I'm not a techie exactly. I just, I like little knobs and things that flash and do everything. I don't know what they do, but I want it. I used to walk up Young Street and there were these great uh, radio sh um, stores and they had diodes going. I go, I want that. Well, what's it do? I don't care. I just want it, you know? So I computerized in 1977, my office. 1977, I had three computers, three typewriters hooked up to the computers. And we got on the internet, I think Rogers came out, I'm gonna guess, I think it was 1980. 90, 90, sorry. So we were on there right away. And there were chat lines in those days. And I was on an academic chat line for real estate. And I said, whoever started with location, location, location? And somebody said Babcock in 1880s in his, in his appraisal book on real estate valuation. And somebody else smartly said, I think it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's one of those silly things that everybody says, ladies and gentlemen, if it's Rosedale, that's location. Around the rest of the city, why do people drive an hour to two hours to get to work in Toronto? For one reason, it's, they drove till they can afford that's not location, location, location. People buy what they can afford. Rosedale's location. This is location. This is location. So that adage of location, location doesn't always work. This is some of the stuff, by the way, um, um, I'm trying to remember this website now. To give you the I can't remember the website. My mind is blank. I started a scrapbook. I was so depressed. In 1980, I was depressed because I'd lost everything. And I didn't know what to do. And in turn, I started a scrapbook. And that is my scrapbook from the crash. That's 1991. I've got another one for 1980. And I kept, it's ironic, years later, those scrapbooks would make me a lot of money. Because when the court cases came up, come out of the 1990s crash, I could go to court and support my arguments with actual stuff from the media and stats and I had all that and I kept this and I was looking at it not long ago we're not even close to what we were back then here's part of my scrapbooks April down they were just filled the articles were filled with stuff so let's take a look at Toronto 
Like I said right now, who, what's, you can't read this. This was 2019, this is impossible. These are some of the largest employers in Toronto, including a police force, including, you know, how, by the way, how many police forces in Toronto? Anybody? How about five? You don't forget CN, the CN and the CP, they, the railway has their own. The, the subway has their own. There's, the Mounties are here. The OPP are here. You know, there's, so there's all kinds of stuff going on. UP, oh, U of T has their own police force. Sorry, maybe six. So the largest employers, we have a ton of them. Whoops, let me get, ah, oh, don't tell me it's not doing it now. Sorry, technical, there we go. Here's something that I use in my listing presentations. Where are you in this echelon, this pyramid? This is about, this is from Mark McLean. I uh, used to be president of Shreb. Mark does these updates, these every now and then. And I just go along, I think this is about a year and a half old. It's really simple. Half of Shreb never sold the house last year. It's that simple. And what are we up to, about 70? 2,000? You see, there's a problem right now in Canada, at, at, in Ontario. There's a baby being born right now at, the, at Toronto General or Mount Sinai, whatever, and the parents are in a dilemma. Not what to name the kid, but does the kid go for a real estate license or a, mor or a mortgage broker's license? Which one? <laughs> I, get, I have a, a small, I had an accident, a small accident, somebody with a bike came in front of me, I slammed on the brakes, hit, hit their dog. The guy in a limo pulls up behind me, sees my license plate, says Lebo on it, because I, brand, I took a branding seminar and I went, I'm putting my name on my car. He sees my car, he gets out, the driver says, are you Barry Lebo? I go, yes. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm in real estate. I go, who isn't? <laughs> So where are you now? So most of the agents don't do much sales. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're worried about competition, don't. It's got to the point that about 7% of all of TREB controls TREB. Here's something else. Teams are dominating. Teams are getting bigger. I know for myself, I was speaking to a, a, a really good agent the other day, and I know what area she works in. I said, you're a fool. I said, we're friends, but you're being foolish. Your, your, your market is diminishing because the ethnic area is changing, and you don't speak Korean, you don't speak Cantonese, you don't speak Mandarin. You're gonna be out of luck in another 10 years, you're losing your whole market. She says, I know. I says, bring somebody in to work with you. I can't give up control. I go, well, then you'll be out of business. It's that simple. If I were staying longer, I'd like to stay longer in real estate, but there's something called longevity. I mean, there's, you know, I'm not gonna be able to do this forever. So, with this said, here's the prime rate. There's 1980. You can see where the bank rate went. Ladies and gentlemen, when that spiked, when we spiked in 1980, a lot of houses were sold. That's what it boils down to. Here's, here, I'm gonna tell you some of my personal stuff. I come into real estate, I'm 21 years old. I left, I, 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 I left school at 17, not voluntarily, they just thought it was better that school and I should not be together. And I left, I was at Bathurst Heights, and um, I was a terrible student. How, did, how many of you knew what you wanted to be in life? Did anybody here want to be a real estate agent when you were about 12 years old? Anybody? Kathy, you don't count. It was in your blood. <laughs> At 12 years old, knowing that my father, who was a great salesman, and everything else, I never wanted to be anything but a salesman. At 15, after school, I was running a crew door to door selling magazines with these kids, and I was hustling them. I had a 16-year-old kid I paid to drive us. I mean, I just wanted to hustle. That's all I wanted. And one day, I had um, left Canada in 67, went to the Israeli army, came back with a bride, and um, we were married for quite a long time, and as Shelly knows, a very lovely woman too. And um, Shelly and I go way back. Um, and what happens is, I um, didn't have much to go on. I had been on Spadina Avenue as a traveling salesman at 19, and all bet. And my dad says, go see somebody, a friend of mine named Marie War. she's a real estate broker. Dad, I can't go to real estate, I, don't, I have to pass an exam. I can't pass an exam. I got 75 out of seven, 75 was the pass mark. I don't know if it's a mercy mark, I got in. I sold 100 houses my first 12 months in real estate. 100 houses. 
And the reason I did, and it's true, about 40 of them were new houses, and a light went on. This is not where the money is. Re new homes, there's no money in it. It's like being in retail. My dad had been in retail when he was young, and he says, why should you be in a business that you have to wait there for the public to walk through the door? Never be in a business where the public has to walk through a door, and that's new home sales. Where in what we do is we go find our clients. And I realized the money was in resale. So what I did was I started going to subdivisions and meeting the builders and going, you take conditional offers, we all did in those days. So they can trade in their house. Do you check their house? No. Well, we just take the offer. I said, so what if they're asking too much for their house? You wasted your time, your house is off the market. Here's the deal, make me your exclusive resale agent I will turn around, I will go do the appraisal, I'll list at the right price and report back to you. And that's how I made my business. And this is what I did. And I realized that every time you're in something, there's an opportunity. Somebody in my office, by the way, did 121 leases in one year. 121 leases. And they're upper end leases. They made over $250,000 plus. Last, you know, doing it. What happened? Successful, but I wouldn't do a lease if you gave it to me. I pass on my leases because I don't do paperwork unless I'm forced to. By the way, I'm an award-winning agent. I get these gold things. I get all this stuff. And I told the girls in the admin, would you go to the dollar store and buy one of those $1 trophies so when we have the awards night, you can give me it for a special award? What's that? It says, if I ever send you a deal with every initial right, every piece of paperwork perfect, once will you give me the award? So far, I haven't won the award. I don't do paperwork. Um, I lost my assistant due to health um, just before COVID, and I keep hoping she's coming back, and I don't have an assistant right now. So with that said, this agent right now, where did she go that was doing 121 leases? Some big builder in one of the high rises said, we think you should come work for us. And she's working there. Guess what? New home sales and high rise are down 79% right now, according to the stats. She could have done another 121. I want you to stop right there for a second. Here's a lesson I learned. I'm busted broke. I had signed, I'd built, we, I was, we were building houses. I was a broker. I had my own office at 345 Wilson. And um, it was a small building. Those of you who know Bagel World, it's a building sort of across the road. We had the two floors. That was our building. We built it for ourselves and two floors of tenants above. And I had my new home division. I had a lot of staff. I stupidly joined Century 21. Not because there's something wrong with Century 20. I'm not a franchise guy. Most of my work was commercial. And with that, things collapsed. And I looked and I said, what am I going to do? Well, how am I going to make a living? I got a wife. I got two kids. I got a dog. And I got to put my food on the table. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call out of the blue. Barry, this is so-and-so, yeah, small trust company. You have uh, an appraisal designation. I go, yeah, I took appraisal designation because I thought it would be good for my business. We're desperate. We need to know all these builders have walked away, these small renovators. We don't know what to do with these houses and everything. And what are we going to do? And can you do this? How much is it worth now? How much is it going to cost to finish it? Things like that. I said, sure, I can do that. And then she went and I did a couple of appraisals, made like $125 or something. And then she turned around and I'm in millions of dollars in debt and I made $125. But you got to understand something. I had not made $125. I remember I used to say to my dad something like, ah, it was only $10. My dad would say, did you make $10 today? You know, if you don't make $10 in a day, $10 spent is $10 lost. So I started, next thing I know, I got these trust companies calling me. I built up one of the largest appraisal firms in Ontario while I was still doing it as a commercial broker. And I had 33 people working for me. And eventually we were all over North America, all over North America. I was traveling extensively. It was an ultra successful business. And um, one day we got a lawsuit. And it turned out the guy in my office had forgot to fill in some forms and we weren't covered by you know insurance. And the lawsuit, I would have eaten about three and a half million dollars. At the end, it cost me over three and a half. And I ended up losing the business, most of the business. We st my firm still exists. Lebo Hicks appraisal still exists, but I'm not part of it. 
And I was so fed up, so angry, I didn't know what to do. And I went back and I hustled and I went back to selling my, what I knew best, commercial real estate. Commercial agents in this office, how many commercial people? Any? Few? I'll tell you something about commercial. It becomes a religious thing because you pray it's going to close. <laughs> I sold in 18 months 10 big deals. The smallest commission was 100,000. Of the 10 deals, five had environmental issues, didn't close. The others had other reasons. Most of them were financial cash flows. I sold apartment buildings and everything. The one deal that closed to one of my best friends, I had to sue him for commission. And I got fed up and then I sat there, this is a true story, with my girlfriend. We went kayaking. And I went to a desert island in Florida, in the Everglades. We sat inside and I said, I am not leaving this island until I come figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And I was afraid to come back to residential real estate. Why? I don't like forms. I don't like the paperwork. It's gotten so bad with the RIA that you want, there's a form now that tells you you're allowed to pee at an open house. I mean, there's a form for that. Um, <laughs> Aria has forms for forms. I mean, there actually is a form with all the forms. And if you ever want to waste the day, just read all the forms. So I decided, and then a certain broker asked me, and I went back to selling real estate, residential. And it's been successful. And I've learned a lot of stuff over the years. There's no such thing. Okay, this is going to deviate. You think I'm crazy when I say this. If you want to really feel good about yourself, I want you to leave here and go out and buy, go to Winners and buy a couple of things, two sizes too big for you. Start wearing them. Everybody's going to go, oh my God, you lost so much weight. <laughs> it's the word they. Ladies and gentlemen, I've learned something. There's no such thing as they. Do not care about how they perceive you. Right now in real estate, there are so many opportunities that are out there, you can't see them. The biggest opportunity I'm seeing right now that I'm looking at, and I, but I don't, I'm not gonna spend the next 10 years getting involved with it, laneway houses. There's gonna be a fortune made by, there's a few agents now, do, somebody says, oh, somebody's already doing it. Really? Toronto's got one restaurant, one car dealer? One dress shop, one men's shop, that's Toronto? What's the ridiculous, he's already doing it. Laneway houses are exploding. I'm getting phone calls. People I sold houses to, I had three calls in the last 10 days. Do you think we should put a, a coach house in our, in, a back, in our back of our house? I said, let's do the math. And what they're charging for them, it's unbelievable. 450 a foot. And the ground floor is a garage. 450 a foot with a concrete block garage empty with a oh and they've got in the garage it's got electricity 450 a foot are you nuts so there's opportunities huge opportunities here's something else I won't do leasing but I'll tell you this if I have to put food on my table I'll do leasing because there's no such thing as a small deal we never saw the commissions that are coming in now, when I started in real estate, my first sale was $12,500. This commission was 6%, and I had to split it with my manager because I was a new agent. That was the deal I had to. I made like two, $300. To turn around today, a lease is greater than commissions that are, some people are in Toronto, a lease is bigger than commissions some people are making in some of the other communities in Ontario for a resale. There's nothing wrong with doing leases if there's money in it. Here's something else. One lease is a pain in the ass. Two leases is a pain in the ass. When you start doing three and four and you get it down to a system, it becomes a system. And then you've got it on your iPad and you've got everything done and boom, 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 boom. And you, you really screen the people before you go with them. You don't run around with these people too much. Here's my criteria. You want to work? You want me to help you find the property? Here's the criteria. You have to give me all this. This is what you have to do. Bang. You don't want to do it? Goodbye. Next. Like a streetcar on Queen Street. Next. So here's something I want you to look at. You see the first arrow up there, the green one? 1976. The land, Ontario land speculation tax, you can buy the find us on, on Market Watch archives, by the way, in Treb. 
Nine, October, April the 9th, 1974, Treb, uh, Treb, Ontario came in with the, uh, with the land speculation tax. I had 33 houses that I had bought, was renovating and reselling. Even though I was a real estate broker, I was working with other brokers. Some of you know who Ralph Nardi is. Nardi sold me a lot of houses. Terry Martell sold me a lot of houses. I got caught. 19,000 homes sold in one of the worst periods we had. The next arrow, the crash, Look at this, it's hard to read, I know that from where you are. In 1980, when the market was still good, we only sold 28,000 houses on Treb. When the market was good, the next year, when the market had 21 and three quarter percent mortgages, we sold more houses because prices came down where people could afford them more. Then we had the crash of the 90s. It went from 1990, we only sold 27,000. 27, in 1991, we hit 38,000 sales. Folks, all you have to look at and say to yourself is, how do I get my share? I guarantee you right now, there are going to be a lot of sales this year. Will there be a lot of 400 square foot filing cabinets in the sky they call condominiums? No! Those things are gone, they're crap to start with. But you look at the good condos, of course they're gonna sell. I'm looking right now for a client in C4 for a decent sized condo, I'm having trouble finding one. That's not over expensive, he wants to stay around the million dollar range. Nothing on Covington right now, nothing. There's always something on Covington, nothing. So then I look here in 2017, when the, when the market was supposed to, where did the market crash in 2017? It was a Burbs thing. It was, it was Richmond Hill, it was Markham. It was mostly within the Asian community, the Iranian community. And look what happened, 92,000 sales. It's an awful lot for a bad time in real estate. Get it through our heads. Please stop looking at the media as a whole. Here's something else. This, we do, I can't find this. I've tried. This is the only stat I could find anywhere in Canada. This is Vancouver. My, my late friend Terry Martel, who was a very close friend and a great broker in his day, probably one of the pioneers, helped cre him and Daryl Kent, the two of them created Cabbage Town or Riverdale as we know it today. And Terry in the 70s, I stood there and said, Mark, it's terrible. Aren't you upset? He goes, it shakes the trees. I go, Terry, what are you talking about? It shakes the trees. There'll be less agents. By the way, if I had my way, Treb fees would start at $5,000. If I had my way. So with that said, remember in a downturn, there's an advantage. What you've got to do is you've got to bob and weave. Here's, here's a tip for you. I charge a minimum of six fifty dollars for an appraisal for evaluation no matter what. They say to me, what's it going to, Barry, we need an evaluation. We may be putting the house, maybe. I go, well, here's the deal. You pay me six fifty dollars for the appraisal, minimum, seven fifty, eight fifty, dollars 1000 depending on what it is. And if you make any kind of a real estate transaction with me or refer me in the next 18 months, I'll refund the money. What part of free, every time I see a sign on a bench or something, free real estate valuations, I sit there, I cringe. How can you make a living at free? I charge my appraisal. I have never had, if somebody says, oh, well, other agents give it for free, I go, I'm sorry, I'm a professional. It's that simple. So do I worry? Not really. Oh, come on, advance, please. Ah, oh, there we go. It's all, here's what it boils down to. Stop reading the media. I've been broke, I've been not broke. And what did I do every time? Oh, by the way, when I, um, Treb asked me years ago, we used to have a great magazine called The Journal. It was a beautiful magazine. Treb said to me, write an article as a former re instructor, why do people fail in real estate? Because you know in the States, the stat is 87% of agents won't be in the business within three years, five, the three to five, four years. 87% turnover. I don't think ours is much different. And I went to office, to office, to office, to office, and I asked all kinds, of, the late Sadie Moranis I interviewed, I interviewed Elise Callas, um, David Wagman, I interviewed all kinds of people. And I'll never forget what one broker said to me, why agents fail. They don't listen. They don't listen. I was broke. I was angry. I was 
depressed, but I had to get up and make a living. I'll tell you how bad things were, why, what I used to do to, out of desperation. I went and put flyers up with permission in police stations, bakeries, and factories that work night shifts. Are you working the night shift? Uh, the day shift, can't you get off at midnight and you can't look at houses? How, you, I will take you out during the night to show you houses. I had lists of vacant houses. I would be out till five and six in the morning showing cops and firemen and other people houses and selling. And you know what? Nine o'clock every morning, no matter how late I was out, including if I played poker once in a while, I would be nine o'clock dressed in my office and working. You've got the number one thing with the top agents, no matter where they are. I've interviewed the top agents. I've worked with, in my appraisal years, I probably, I, I was doing all the work for J&D, for Chestnut, for, for when Forest Hill just started. Um, Elise, I, I can't begin to tell you how much work I did with Elise Callis. And guess what? Every agent I knew that was top had one thing in common, discipline. They may not be organized, but their assistant sure was. You've got to be organized. You gotta know where you're going. You gotta get up every day and get be disciplined. And here's the thing. We are a really strange breed of people. You gotta wake up. Good morning, this is the news. And now for the Dow Jones. And now for the Toronto stock. And now for this. It's depressed, people are dying in the streets. The food banks are filled. 20% of people can't pay their bills. Da, 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 da. And you gotta go, what a great day to sell real estate. And it's true. Because ladies and gentlemen, one of the things, I'm, I'm in a senior field, most of my work now is seniors, and I was th thriving before COVID, and the stat is now 97% 90, of seniors don't wanna move. Why do we have such a problem with, with, with inventory? Because the baby boomers and what's left of their parents don't wanna move. This COVID has changed the mentality. So who am I working with? Circumstance. They're either going into a home or they're dying. I love, I love estate work. I love estates. I've never had a dead person ask for an open house, ever. <laughs> it's really good. I just moved a 97-year-old. She was delightful. Delightful lady. I just enjoyed every minute of it. Anyways, you've got to find, and the other thing is, find a niche. Don't be like every other. Right now, you see, you've got three choices, four choices in real estate. When you come in, you're an unknown. Then you get into it, you become a commodity. Then if you're really good, you become a, um, um, what do you call it, um, a, an expert, but um, a certain type of expert that where a certain family loves you, knows you, makes all the moves, but you want to become a go-to expert. If I said to you right now, who sells horse farms in the province of Ontario? There's only one or two brokers that do it. Boom, like that. Moffat Dunlop is, like Dunlop is one of them. Bang, right off the top of my head. Who sells upper end condos? If I wanted to buy a $10 million condo, who's that person or those people that do it? Boom, you've got to find your niche. If it has to be residential leasing, you can do 100 leases in a year, do it. Be that go-to person because nothing is worse as a commodity. Here, okay, you, you, you want to play with me? Somebody play with me? You want to play with me for a second? Okay, I walk into your house. And I'm a commodity real estate agent. I'm just, you think of me like anybody else. And one of the first things you're gonna ask me as a realtor is, as a seller, what are you gonna ask me? How much is my house worth? No, not how much your house is worth, but you're getting close. How much? And my answer always is, that should not be your first question. So what do you think the comeback from that would be? What should be your first question? This is the way I do this all the time. I go, your first question is, can I get you the maximum price for your house? That's your first question. And let me show you how, because you've got a choice. I've got this in my listing presentation, by the way. I show them in my listing presentation. Uh, sometimes I use my laptop. Sometimes I use hard co a cover for seniors. And I say to them like this, I'm gonna give you a choice, it's like being on one of those game shows. There's two doors. You can only go through one, you can only have two choices. Do you want the lowest commission or the highest price for your house? Which one do you want? Because you can't have both. But we want both. You can't have both. You can have one 
You can have the other, but you can't have both. If you want a cheap agent, so I say to them like this, okay? Just play with me. I was lucky. I went to NAR, to NAR. By the way, the National Association of Realtors does not like to be called NAR. They like to be called N-A-R. I found that out the hard way when I kept saying NAR to them. <coughs> I went to a convention three years ago, just before COVID, and I saw a guy do 101 ways to defend your commission. He, Michael Lee is his name. He wrote a book. I've got the book. And Michael said something, and I spun it. Kathy, I'm going to tell you something. But Barry, somebody else will do it for how low? Throw a figure at me. Uh, 1.2. 1.2. Kathy, so you're telling me it's a million dollar condo. That's what, 12, you know, 12 grand? 1.2? They're going to do it for 12. Kathy, you look like a really nice person. I'm probably not going to work with you, so can I at least give you some good advice? Would you walk up to a perfect stranger on the street and give him $12,000? Would you? So you think I'm crazy asking the question. But would you give him $11,000? Well, then that's exactly what you're doing because they're going to do nothing for you at a 1% or 1.2. They're going to do nothing. So why don't I do this? I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to go back to my office. I'm going to send you a list of companies who will list your house for $1,000. I just saved you $11,000. You owe me a favor. By the way, my birthday's at this. Send me a card for thanking me. And I walk out. I walk out. I'll tell you something. Ellie Davis years ago taught me something way back, 30 years ago. I turned and I said something. She says it's called walk away tolerance. Walk away. Guess what? You go in, you're, on, you're walking down the streets, you're in South Beach, you walk in, you see two restaurants. One's got a lineup, one you can walk right in. What you don't know is two minutes before you got there, everybody that was in the other lineup got in and they're just gonna start the lineup again. You would perceive that the one with nobody standing in line is the worst restaurant. So you get in the line. The more you say no, the more they want you. Anyways, with that, I'm gonna finish. Bob, weave, and stop listening to the media, okay? It's that simple. Um, we're going to stick around for like 10 minutes. We have our amazing partners here from Vaughn and... Well, I'm doing a 24-hour urine test. I've been studying, so oh, I have okay. to... <laughs> okay, come on. Come up here, maybe. Can, can we sit around for like? Do you want me to sit up here? Yeah. Oh, what? okay. I want to ask you. you. A oh. Okay. So we're asking on behalf of the agents. If the agents have any questions, they're welcome to ask. Ah. Um, but that was re very, very informative. That was amazing. It's always great to hear from somebody who's living the life that we're living and can see it through our eyes because we often have speakers who don't actually get what it means to be a realtor in this <laughs> market. Um, and uh, here we have our amazing partners from Michael Switzer. Hello. Michael. Oh, Switzer. Michael! Of course. Oh, tried before. Yeah, yeah. Of course. And this is Paul Ben David. He's from our our office. He's the managing partner. Right. Stephen Switzer. Hi, Steve. Stephen. You know. Hey, Fred. I'm here. Hi, Hi Barry. Hi. How are you? He's Thank our you. managing partner from Witchwood. You've got like all our, our partners here: Rebecca, Hemelfarb. And uh, thanks to everyone. Yeah. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you guys, maybe we can just like have a little bit of a casual conversation. Yeah, I can start it off. I, okay, I think perfect. Just to point out the thing that I, first of all, what you said was fantastic, and I, everyone here, like, I, I can speak on behalf of all of us to say, like, that was so on the point of what I think we all need to hear. Everything with the media and all the bullshit that's coming at us all the time. It's nice to hear, like, that what we are saying is not just coming from us; that it's coming from somebody like you who has so much experience and. We all respect what you're saying very much. Um, the one thing that I'll say to add on to it is like we, were, we had a meeting with an agent earlier today, um, this morning actually, and we were having the same conversation about what most agents right now seem to be doing is putting their heads in the sand instead of actually getting to work. And I think what really comes down to it, it's, it's not necessarily about prices, it's about the amount of inventory of deals that are happening in markets like this. And if you think that this is going to continue on, it's not. So the work that you're putting in right now, this is what's going to translate into the amount of you getting your piece of the pie because there are deals happening right now and there are deals that are going to keep happening and it's going to get busier and busier. So, you know, just to add on to what Barry was saying, I just think it's really important for all of us, for anyone who has been putting their heads in the sand in any way, 
It's the opposite. Put your head down and like run as hard as you can into this market right now. And buy, and you know what, I'm a listing agent. Um, I made that uh, thing, I don't want to work weekends. I just don't. And um, I'm going to have to suck it up. I'm going back to buyers for a while, but serious buyers. You got to go where the market is. For sure. Yeah. And if I could just throw my own two cents in there, you know, Barry talked a lot about the media and the perception that it has on people, how, you know, not just the general public, but realtors too, we get negative, we see this all day long, we start to believe it. Um, but that can also turn around quickly. And, you know, for, for people like me who haven't been in the business as long as Barry, I, I wasn't uh, around in the early You weren't even born that long. long. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember the crash in the 90s. I saw how the foreign buyers tax in 2017 affected the suburban markets, which is largely where I work. Um, and I remember how quickly things turned around when the media started to jump on the bandwagon. And for 18 months, it was bubble is burst, bubble is burst, market is dead, you'll never afford a house. And then one day there were three articles in the same day saying, price is set to skyrocket you better get on while you can because yeah. the market's about to take there's off. No, there's never going to be a time when the media says, guys, everything's great. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Like the media is always going to be trying to, do, it's just clickbait. They're just trying to stress everybody out, whether you get the kids, how are the kids going to buy a house, which is what it was for the last decade. And now it's shifted into, oh my God, how are you ever going to sell your house? And if you look back, like what Barry was showing before about these old publications, all those old articles, I guarantee you, if we went through all the old articles, you would see that so much of the stuff has been over and oh over yeah! And over. Oh yeah! And they just changed. The oh place. yeah! They changed the, the key factors and the names associated and the areas that are hot and cold. Yeah. But they're just circulating the same stuff. When the market's down, they circulate this. When the market's hot, they circulate this. So don't buy into it. And most importantly, don't let your clients be bought. Don't let your clients buy into that because we're their advisors, and it's so important for us to be able to know for ourselves first, like what is what. Because if we don't know, then they're not going to know. Would you go to a driving school where the instructor doesn't drive a car? Exactly. <laughs> None of these correspondents own real estate, most of them. They're not, they don't make a lot of money. They're uh, opining on stuff that they're not part of. Even this morning, uh, up until today, I saw everybody saying sky, the rates are skyrocketing, real estate is crash, and so forth. This morning, for federal policy, federal government aiming now to, uh, for immigration levels of half a million people to come to Canada without housing. Yeah, well, we saw the housing prices. <laughs> we have no housing prices. Yeah. So, how the hell are you going to crash? Yeah. It's, it makes no sense. You guys like literally shoot each other in the foot. Yeah. Fear sells, guys. That's, that's all it is. If it, breathe, if it bleeds, it leads. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Right, well, I definitely like also the point that Barry brought up where I, I call it the filter market where when things are so easy and oh one day on the market sold over asking 200,000 I'm a rock star agent now they're nowhere to be found but <laughs> yeah. those who are right now succeeding to these markets are actually taking the listings and selling those are the ones you see in the business for a long long time so the, good, the good agents are going to rise so yeah. the, the vol that's what yeah. it comes down to. we have vulgarity in our business absolute vulgarity selling Beverly Hills mm -hmm. and all these shows, yeah. they are disgusting. They don't represent the kind of realtors I've never met, not talking it, but everybody, some of the most generous human beings I've ever met in my entire life are realtors. And um, the ones I know that work a lot with seniors and that, they're in it because they just love the clients. We're really, for the most part, these are, we do good work and the Realtor Care Foundation, everything, and all of a sudden, we're did you ever see a real estate, anybody, developer or agent, in a, mo in a movie or a thing that doesn't turn out to be the murderer <laughs> or the thief? <laughs> we're never portrayed nicely. It's true. I wouldn't, I'm not going because of it. She's absolutely true. Oh, wait, where are, are you, you talking about the conference in Niagara? No, you're really class. Aria. I won't go because that's one of the main reasons I refuse to go. Because she's everything that's wrong. Here, here's something else. Ladies and gentlemen, why did we have such a bad run of real estate the last years? Because Aria and then a Humber 
ground out these agents that don't have a clue about the business. I was eight years a re-instructor. All of us who were good instructors, and I was a good instructor, I know that. Not, not ego, reality. All of us that were good instructors were thrown out or slowly squeezed out. Why? They wanted us to be at a certain time, page 33, chapter this, and reading from the book. That's not how you learn real estate. We were teaching how to write offers and the process. They come into real estate, they didn't have a clue about value. 999, offer night, take the best offer and go. They never, an email, don't phone me, don't talk to me. I have no people skills, so let's not do that. And they caused a lot of the problems we're doing today. If you want to know where the root of this is, it starts with a RIA education, it goes to Humber. It's horrible. The, the bar to get into this and that process of the multiple uh, and the bidding wars. Oh, of course, there were always bidding wars. There were bidding wars when I was a kid, but not like this. This was obscene. Yeah. I'm on um, the board of directors for RICO, and one of the things, a lot of it's confidential, but one of the things that we do <laughs> talk about that isn't confidential is, is the need for an apprenticeship program or some yep. kind of... Um, revisiting of Humber and, I, and my point when I'm in these meetings is always that we have such robust training within Forest Hill, for example, Forest Hill Ivy League and I mean it's fantastic that we have it and I'm glad that we can provide it but we really shouldn't have to. We should have cl- people coming out of Humber that know how to write an agreement to lease and know how to write and it's no one's fault. I'm not blaming the realtors at all um, and I'm, again, it's fantastic that we're able to have those kinds of programs, but at the end of the day, that really is the, you know, the we, we, provider's we've, we've job had, to we've train had agents these realtors. who have come into our office that have been in the business for 15 years, and we've sat down with them to help them on their first deal, and been like absolutely, I mean, with all due respect, like baffled by like, you don't, what, what is this? And I'd be like, that's a condition for a home inspection. I'd be like, what do you mean? You know, like, you don't know that's a condition for home inspection, then we need to talk, like, a lot more about this, you know? And it's, that's an extreme, obviously, but the reality yeah. is, is that we're very lucky, and what we have to look at it in, in regards to, like, our team as a whole in Forest Hill, and whether you're at any of the offices, we're very lucky to have the kind of consistency with the training. Because, you know, what Barry was saying before about the consistency that you would see in any of these top producers, what was, the, what was it? That's the real word. It's consistently working and hustling. And we're consistently working and hustling, and we're also consistently working to train. And you know, I love seeing a full room. And I, I, whichever, whenever we do these training sessions, for whether they're in office or they're when we combine, it's like you know, we're always trying to give the best that we can give, so that you have the advantage over all of these really terrible agents, like the ones that they're talking before. There's the majority. And we, and and I'll tell you something. And I know you all know this from being in the business. We chew these agents up, and that's what it's all about. It's like let them be where they are, but but it's most important for us to know where we are. And you know stuff like this, and getting this kind of, this is priceless information that you get from a gentleman like Barry Lebo. Like this is this is like a an OG in the business. You know what Adam I mean? Adam on Facebook. So Adam on Facebook, <laughs> uh, original gang. Okay. If, if I, I have. I keep getting thrown in the Facebook jail sometimes for only reposting what somebody else posted. <laughs> Yeah, I'm one of the experts on real estate hacks. stupidity of agents out there who are asking the public questions instead of their broker or manager. Yeah. They come out and they know nothing. I'll give the Barry stupidest that. questions that they should know the answers to. I'll give yeah, Barry that point. I just a yeah. comment. I was trained as a facilitator for Humber, for Humber and I agree with all of it. And the Humber dean will say that Humber is just the delivery system. Yeah. The yeah. that is, uh, is provided. Oh, yeah. It's very bureaucratic I don't, and political. Why don't we create a co-op? Well, 40 years ago, we had a conference for educators from across Canada, led by the University of British Columbia, which was the only real estate um, um, education 
in Canada, higher education, um, and um, we all met at Humber. I was one of the people honored to be in the group. And we had come up with a program to, for all of Canada with a base score, and then each province teaches what's particular to their province. And it was brilliant, and it never was adapted. What? You know, when, I, when I did my courses at Aurea, I won't tell you when, it was obviously after Barry, but uh, I had a, a teacher, his name was Ron Abraham. Oh, no, Ron, well, too so, well. And the courses were well structured. You learned about ethics and forms and how to do your paperwork and all that. But the courses don't teach you anything about how to make a living in this business, okay? And Ron would, he would come in and in the first few minutes he'd say, we're gonna rush through everything and I'm gonna spend the last half hour answering questions. And in that half hour, he taught me more about real estate over the course of this, you know, several week program than I would have learned three years in the business, you know, trying to, to get that from my managers or whoever else. And he told us how to find clients. How you run an open house, what you say in a listing presentation, oh. how do you find buyers? You don't, you don't get that from the courses. And if Ori is not on the ball teaching you that, it's even more important that you land in a good place with good managers who take training seriously and will teach it to you. What Mike was saying earlier about you guys having a huge advantage is true. You're in a good place with good training. But you also have to suffer the frustrations of knowing that 60 to 70 percent of the agents you're dealing with on your deals are not in places like that. 90. They signed up at an office because they offered them the best commission. They didn't ask anything after that. What's my commission? Can I have an office? You know, that's all they're looking for. Out of school, right out of school. Right out of school. Yeah. And and my advice to you is don't let the frustration turn you into a person who's angry at those agents and is mean to them. Rather. Know that you can direct them the way you want to direct them, and you will have to. I spend a lot of my time when I'm negotiating with other agents, politely guiding them on how to do their job. They'll say, you "Oh, my guy doesn't want my guy." You know, they'll they'll say, "My guy doesn't want to spend that much." I'll say, "Okay, here's what you do: show them these two properties. Here's your two costs." You're going to charge out of that. You know, like you know, tell them tell them what these sold for. We can go back and forth, you know, bring them along, and you unfortunately have to tell other agents how to do their jobs sometimes. If anybody watches, I gotta, I, if anybody I, like a Star Wars fan, you know, with the Force, I know it's a weird thing to say out of very random, but like a lot of the time with these agents that are these type of agents, like you can literally use the Force. The Jedi mind Like you can tell them what to do and they do it. And like, I, I urge you to try it next time you're in negotiation with someone and just literally just stop what you're doing and just say, here's what you're gonna do. Go back to your client. Tell them to sign into this. Tell them this, 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 and this. And they'll be like, okay. Yeah, give them the tools. They're just waiting. It's like as if you become their manager and yeah. we don't work together, like they're a different office or we're doing a deal together, but you could literally just guide them along how you want to. And for the most part, they are, because they are not strong negotiators, quite frankly, they don't know better than to, and then all of a sudden you become their advisor. It's like, okay, I'm not really your advisor. You know, we're, I'm actually on the other team. But when you, if you do it properly, with confidence and you understand like how much you can actually control a situation, how much you can influence someone, you'll see that a lot of the time, and I'm not just talking about agents who are not producing agents, not about producing, because a lot of the agents who actually are producing agents, the same thing applies. For the most part, a lot of them are just trying to make a deal. And if you're advising them and this is how this is, deal is gonna work, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know what, I gotta make dinner at seven o'clock, and okay, okay, I'm gonna call my client back and I'm gonna tell them to do this, and then they, all of a sudden you get their sign back, how, how you wanted it. Yeah, so that's like, the day they want to get the deal. They want to do the deal. Yeah, they do. They're, well, they're yeah, working yeah. with you. And, and keep in mind, and I always say this because sometimes we forget, the other agent is not our adversary. Like, we're not at war with them. We're, right. all, I hate to say it, we're on the same team. <laughs> we're both trying to get a deal done. Yeah. So you don't want to come in super aggressive. And some of them didn't get them. that message. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 some of them don't have that message, but you have that but message. But you have yeah. that, and well, you want right. to part that. It's like what Jeffrey, when Jeffrey came into office the training, one of the best things he said is like, who's going to make you the most amount of money? Yeah. And people say, you know, clients. As I said, no. Agents. Realtors. Yeah. Other realtors will make The relationships you have with other agents. Yeah, yeah so agreed. The business, though, clients and realtors alike, is all, if you do not maintain a relationship, build a relationship with an individual, it's going to reciprocate one with another. Yeah. And these are long term relationships. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, you like to yeah. sit across a table from someone who you, you respect. I, um, I think that's really good agents grease the wheels when you're across the table. I'm going to say something. I, I'm a commercial broker. And I closed my brokerage 10 years ago yesterday. I went to, back into residential. 
And the very first few days I was in, um, one of the guys that I was supposed to partner with said, I'm going on holiday, can you take over my listing in case there's a call? I get a call, there's three offers on the property that night, and I go, okay, I'll go up there. Now, I haven't sold a house in some years except the family members. And this guy, I walk into a house, the guy's in his late 40s, there's not a picture on the wall, almost no furniture. He's lived in the house for five years, and he's going back to live with his mother. Does that give you an idea of who I'm dealing with? <laughs> These three offers, this one offer is so incredibly good because I'd done a CMA before I went up there and up in, off Clark Avenue and I can't move this guy. I can't get him to understand that this is a great offer. So finally, I just went into automatic mode. I reached deep down inside. I took a script I learned from Jerry Bresser, the king of real estate trainers who wrote the greatest book ever on real estate called List More, Sell More, which has been updated. And Jerry's 88 and I'm still in touch with Jerry. He's fabulous. Jerry Bresser, I took a Jerry Bresser script. I repeated it. it just, his words came out. I did exactly what Jerry had said. I left the pen where the guy was to sign on the, on the offer in front of him. And then I shut up and the guy sat there for a minute or two, picked up the pen and said, where do I sign? Yeah, I didn't do anything. What I'm saying to you is like this. Number one, you got to be trained. You've got not just your own office. You also need to be coached and you've got to be coachable. And here's something else. This is the pandemic changed me too. I sit in where I am in my kitchen. I can see into my giant, I have a big screen TV, mother's screen TV. And I have a smart TV, I have YouTube. I went searching. Every day I'm home, when I'm home for lunch, I watch a YouTube training video on real estate. Every day. The Jeff Glover out of Michigan, I'm in love with Tina Call. I don't like she's with EXP, but that doesn't take away, doesn't taint who she is. Um, there's a, um, a couple of other people. There's one guy I've watched his um, presentation now about 12 times. I've sat my girlfriend down and said, you gotta watch this. Um, it's amazing. Um, Randy Ora, O-R-A. The best, absolutely the best re listing presentation I've heard in my life. Stop learning. You out. have to be, you, you have to be coachable to be in real estate. Yeah, and if you look, it's like the same thing as being a professional athlete. Like you, you look at the greatest golfers in the world are constantly practicing and learning from other golfers. The prep, the, you know, you, you have One to skill at a time. Ways to inspire yourself and to get better every single day. But you've got to make it your own. Yeah. Don't follow the flock. Take the ideas and create them into your own personal. Oh, yeah. Sure. By the way, my ferry and a lot of them, their scripts are right there free on, online. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all available. It's yeah. there. Yeah. Tom Ferry. Hi, I'm Tom Ferry. I always want to put a pie in his face sometimes, but, but he's great. I listen to him all the time. He's great. He's I like him. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. I like Tom. He's a good guy. We're driving a lot. You know, put on a podcast. Well, yeah, put on a podcast. That's what I do. Yeah. And use, you know, why waste the time? Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions that you want to ask? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, well, that was Does anybody want us to validate their parking? <laughs> okay. Oh, like, a couple questions. <laughs> I couldn't hear. Marx Brothers. Marx Brothers. Marx Brothers. Marx Brothers. 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 Yeah. yeah. So they had an office, and when the client came in, uh, they said, "Here are our principles, but if you don't like them, we have others." <laughs> <laughs> and I think what our speaker said today is that we must only stick to our principles because there is nothing others for realtors to be, first of all, successful, and as an example, because we have a very bad name. So this is what he said we must do. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And then one question, I need a commercial colleague, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll connect you with someone. Okay, yes, yeah. Okay, cool. yeah, and Sora, yes. Yeah. You're on. Uh, this is a good question. Um, so, I've only been here now, this is my second year, um, and I've done just these deals so far on my own. Um, last year, I 
year I'm looking to do it a lot more full time, and I'm wondering if it's better to kind of uh, have a mentor in Forest Hill or to work in a team. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on. You're the boss. <laughs> What, is, is it better to have a mentor, mentor or a team um, or both? It's, yeah, it's, I mean a team's great, a great way to get into the business, um, except that you have to split your business too. So some people who have their own clients don't really want to go into a team. If you could have like an accountability partner, that's what I sort of yeah, rec- that's what that's we use I really recommend. recommend. It's not really a short answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah there's yeah. a lot of cool follow up questions, it, and I'm happy to have a conversation. And it's a lot about what yeah. you're looking yeah. for as yeah. well. It's like, yeah. yeah, are you looking for, you? for someone to give you business? Are you looking for someone to give you guidance? Are you looking for, you know, and then one of the great things about Forest Hill when it comes to guidance is that you don't need a team leader for guidance. You call your manager. That's what. That's what we're providing. That's one of the wonderful things. If you things have twenty four seven mentorship from any of these offices, like that's that's one thing. Oh, my mentors one of our one of our <laughs> sounds like gone. a pitch. <laughs> but uh, you know, when, I, when we had a, an agent that just joined us uh, we'll uh, in our rural office that we were meeting with the other day, I do have, and they're uh, an experienced agent for ten years. And when we were talking, and, and I said, well, and I, at the end of the thing, I said, by the way, here's my card. Put this in your phone. Call me. I don't care. Text me at ten o'clock on a Saturday night. We're all that way. And the guy looked at me and was like, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, that's what this is. Like when you come here, real estate doesn't happen nine to five, as you all know. It happens at you know, 10 o'clock on a Saturday night when you're out at a, a dinner with your friends and all of a sudden you get that offer on that house you've been trying to sell. Yeah. If you don't know what's going on, find me another real estate brokerage that you have all of your, your manager's text messages uh, that it text information that you can text me right away any single time. And I get that, we all get that all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. What's up with this? What's up with that? And I'll tell you something. If I'm not able to respond within a couple minutes, then I'm going to send it to somebody else from our team and I'll say, guys, I'm wrapped up. I need you to deal with this right now. And one of us is always here. So you do have mentorship. But in, in regards to your question, I, like it really, like they said, it's, it's, it really comes down to what you're looking for. And, and I think that's more of something that you guys can discuss. These brokers that, yeah. you know, you just pay a, a certain fee and it's, you get all, almost 100% commission. Yeah. There is absolutely <coughs> zero uh, management, they're on their own. They they glow in the dark. Now, I have a second business. I am an expert witness. I'm called in. I'm one of the only people. Me and Brian Madigan, the only two in Canada. We do litigation where real estate agents are being sued. I've never had to do one where Forest Hills involved. Um, I have two broker friends that are large brokerages in Toronto. I've had one of them 12 against their firm, another one 13. I was thinking of doing a seminar to teach them what they're doing wrong, and I realized, why would I kill the golden goose? <laughs> but these agents that are being sued, right now, I, I, I'm just talking to Shelley about time right now. We were talking about what's going on. I can't, I can't breathe. I've got eight files to get out, deadlines plus my real estate business. There's so many agents being sued, it's unprecedented. And most, most of them come from pretty shitty firms. Yeah, well you get what you pay for. It's like the same thing, if you, if you, you, know, you want to buy a, a property, you want to buy a car, you want to buy, go for dinner, want to work at a real estate office, it's like you can't expect to get anything different than what you're, what you're paying for. Yeah. So, you know. Better get 50% and make a damn good living than 100% and end up going back driving a cab. That's right. Oh, please. Uh, what was the script you said to your client that got you to sign? Do you want to know the script? Yeah. It's called the speculator's script. You put a really good offer in front of somebody, and they don't look, they look at it and they want, they're the greedy seller. Like, you know, one thing about being my age, I just look at it and go, oh, what Toronto needs, another greedy seller. They go, I'm not a greedy, yeah, you are. I'm not afraid to say things like that. So they're a greedy seller, and you realize it, and you sit there, and you want to be rational. So the speculator script is very simple. It's a great, I've used it more than once. And the idea is like this. You put a really good offer, you've shown them the comparables. It's not like you're just throwing a number. You've got, here's a sales that happened. This is better than the last sales. And they're still not accepting. So you say, I am so sorry, Michael. I am so confused right now, you have no idea. I thought you were a seller of real estate. I didn't realize you're a speculator in real estate. And you shut up. And they go, what are you talking about? I'm not a speculator. Michael, I just presented you with an offer that's greater than the value of anything that's sold in the area. You're getting the highest price ever sold in this area for this type of house. 
and you're rejecting it because you are speculating that we're going to come along and get a better offer later. So you've stopped being a seller. You're now a speculator. Are you a seller or are you a speculator? And then I shut and up and really put the. Shut up. And then I shut right up. Yeah. I have used that three times in my career in the last few years. And each time, and you put the pen right down on the page where they sign and you shut up, and each time they picked up the pen. And there's an expression that goes along with that one, it's the first one who talks loses. <laughs> so it's like, and, and I'll tell you- Oh, I gotta talk, I gotta interrupt. I had some really awesome- I gotta interrupt. Yeah, I'm a kid, I'm 21, it's my first real estate offer. I'm scared. A guy, John McDonald, an old time real estate agent was with me, and I brought him with this to present, and he says, you know, and he says with a very heavy Scottish accent, and he smoked the pipe, in those days already smoked it out. He says, and we'll sit here and you can read this offer. And he says, remember, lad, the first person that speaks loses. Shut up. And we sit there, five minutes go by, 10 minutes. We were up to 20 minutes when the seller lifts his head finally and says, we can't read. <laughs> <laughs> But for the most part, it does work. <laughs> it'll say, you know, you just sit there and be quiet, and you'll see a lot of the time, like they could in their own language. You could have those awkward stare, you know, like even if you're not even looking at them, you just let them, let like let the, the sellers decide or let the buyers decide, and then once they make their decision, you'll see the. Most of the time, they'll come to the conclusion, and and then they'll say, okay, let's do it. I say, let's go. Okay, let's do it. And just that silence is just like it's what they needed to just ponder, and then yeah. they move on. Yeah. You know? yep. And the same thing applies when you're negotiating with agents, just for the record. If you're negotiating with someone and you're, and you're up against them and, and you, you know, you're both, you're, you know, which it always comes to the same thing. Oh, we're, well, we're five grand apart on a $3 million house and that's where this is going to die. Just make your position and shut up and you'll see they'll get awkward before you, before you do because you know what you're doing and then they'll, they'll just say, okay, fine. Or even if they say, okay, I'll give you 3,500, whatever the, the, the delta is. I'm just saying, it, it, a lot comes out of that silence. So try it. Let's see. I'm so disappointed when I came here today to check yeah, out Donna Balika. Where did I? We charge for. You do four. No, you know, I'll do three and a half. And, and you know, I'll do this. Yeah, because, Shut up. Yeah, that's right. Except for. Excuse me. Move yeah. on. Keep it up. Vivian loves her. Just say generally. Don't oversell it. Don't try to be like, oh, he's probably not like it. Okay, let me do this. Let me do that. Just give yourself away. Good. Any other questions? Guys, there. good hunting. Is that what they were talking about? Oh. All right, go ahead. How do you define the niche market that you want to go in? I have, a, I have a seminar I do for boards called Finding the, Your Niche Market. I have defined over 100 plus niches in real estate. Over 100. There are so many. Now, in Toronto, some of them don't apply. I mean, you're not going to sell a horse farm in Toronto. But um, in my niche is seniors, estates, things like that. Uh, and litigation stuff where two partners. I, l I love when two people, let two people marry two sisters. Within five years, there will be a complete breakdown. Why did she get the coat? Why are they going to Florida? We didn't go to Florida, we're partners. What's, I love that stuff. Um, but um, uh, the niches are there and the niches, you gotta find your niche. Look up real estate niches. There's actually a website, I believe, that teaches about niches. I have a seminar called Finding Your Niche. If you're interested, let me know. Yeah, I can get you in with the boards. We'll have a, we'll have yeah. have I want to do a shout out. I want to do a shout out. That woman there changed my life right there, Shelly. Yeah. She changed my life. Oh, I know why. I know. She changed my life. Thir thir <laughs> 13 years ago, I had come out of, Shelly, it, it was a horrible marriage. It was my horrible marriage. Um, I hated, I was so, I was crying so much when my ex-wife got in a broom and flew away. Um, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> But Shelly, Shelly, it's true, isn't it? But Shelly, Shelly, I wouldn't date again, ever again, ever. And she manipulated me to take somebody out. It's been the best 13 years of my life. I, it's very easy. I am an expert. I am an expert on where mortgage rates are right now. Come back in 12 months and I will give you the answer. No one, no, one, no, one no one knows. Here's the thing. The government, the liber there was an article in today's post that the liberal government is, tr is it's their thing of 
throwing, high, raising the rates to control inflation, which they caused to start with. But leaving that alone, I want to get political, yeah. except it's political liberal government. <laughs> Anyways, they are going. There's an election going to be coming up in what a year and a half, give or take. You watch what's going to be pressure. They can't maintain this. These interest rates being raised, raised, raised. I guarantee there's political. They're going to throw us some bones. Yeah, yeah they have. To. And not only that, ladies and gentlemen, Shelley, when you started, what was the mortgage rate? Uh, no, when you start, what was the mortgage rate? Yeah, so 89 mortgage rate was about 10 percent, 8 percent. It was lower. Does, uh, we sold real estate for 20 years at 10 and 12 percent rates. That was the way it was. By the way, if rates had never gone below seven, the average detached house would be 650, 700,000. People didn't buy houses, they rented cheap money. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing about uh, Mark, I just want to throw this point out. I always talk about with my clients, people always talk about rates and whatever. You know, Canada, one of the, the things that, that, that were different than, say, our neighbors in the US, where we don't have options for where people are going to go. You have all this immigration coming in. In Canada, all you really have is, you know, you got Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary, and stuff. But Toronto is the main hub. Like yeah. you said before, all the businesses, finances, biggest universities, all in, the, in Toronto, GTA. Anybody that wants to come to Canada, who want to come to the GTA, yeah. right? Unless you're in the oil fields or in the oil business, fine, you'll go to Alberta. Mm -hmm. Other than that, Quebec, not as far. I mean, you Vancouver can, is like the LA can, of Canada. You can even centralize it even more within Toronto, within the GTA, <coughs> literally from the Oak Ridge's moraine to the lake. There's not really much else between. You can't keep building on the moraine, you can't go into the lake. Exactly. So it's like if going east to west, the central Straight area. Straight up. Like, it's, 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 <laughs> and, and that's why we have a housing crisis. That's, that's why we have a housing shortage. When, when I talk to people like, oh, in the U.S., this is happening. Like, in the U.S., you have how many cities? Yeah. Yeah. So Chicago, look at, look at the LA, prices. New York. You know, you've got so many options. So our t our tenth biggest city, I think, is London or Kitchener. I can't remember. Yeah. Their tenth biggest city is like Boston or yeah. something. You know. <laughs> so like, yeah. You know, when you talk to your clients and you talk to people, that's one of the biggest things people need to remember. Canada is very limited of where people are going to go. Our market is always going to thrive. I agree. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.